Dear congregation, I invite you to turn in God's holy word to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. We'll read the entire chapter. Just to set the context of Daniel chapter 8, we find this vision, these visions that are given to Daniel in Daniel 7 through, through 12. And we recognize that in Daniel chapter 7, there, was, there were four beasts. Um, and um, the first was like a lion with had eagle's wings. That was very clearly the, uh, the Babylonian empire, Babylonian kingdom. And suddenly there was another beast, the second like a bear, and out we uh, assumed as the media Persian empire. And, um, and then thirdly, there was a third beast in verse 6, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now that beast that's portrayed there in Daniel 7 verse 6 is the beast that is spoken of here in this vision that Daniel receives on the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the vision of the ram and the goat. And, and so we hear God's holy word as it comes to us, Daniel chapter 8. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. And I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the providence of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulea. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and there, standing beside the river, was a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, south, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a, a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. The goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram and he was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. There was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in the place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came an, a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of the transgression, an enemy was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Then it happened, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Eulea, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood and 
When he had come, I was afraid and fell on my face. And he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of, this, of the indignation. For at the appointed time the end shall be. The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart and shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Amen. May God bless the reading of his precious and infallible word. May he also bless the exposition of it. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, I confess I was looking at Facebook this past week, and I saw a Facebook post. I basically asked the question, what is your view of the church or of the Christian life? And on that post, it had a picture on the top of a luxurious cruise ship an ocean liner. And on the bottom of the picture, it had a picture of a battleship. Which one would be your view of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and our Christian life? The world events of this past week and the book of Daniel kind of hit me between the eyes. When you see diseases and droughts and earthquakes and wildfires and wars, rumors of wars, huge shifts in foreign policies of Western nations, Persecution like history has never seen before. How do we live in such times? Such times when our brothers and sisters in North Korea continue to be persecuted by a tyrannical dictator, Kim Jong-un. Horrific times for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in Afghanistan where the Taliban comes to their houses taking their wives and their children and their daughters, checking their phones, whether they have Bible apps or any kind of correspondence with the West. Their lives are at stake for the very name of Jesus Christ. The persecution that continues on in Pakistan, the Hindus in India, Libya, Somalia, the drug lords of Colombia, the persecution we heard about in Nigeria this morning. 
We read the book of Daniel and especially the dreams and the visions and the apocalyptic literature. It's combined with historical fulfillments. What does it say to us? What it says to us is that it gives us confidence in our God who knows the end from the very beginning and who has all of history in His control. And the victory is ultimately the Lord's. That's how Daniel could be greatly encouraged and that's how we can be greatly encouraged in times of global calamities, wars, and persecution by knowing the ultimate victory belongs to the Lord. However, This does not mean everything will be easy, like being on a cruise ship. Things won't always be comfortable for the people of God. We know from Scripture that there will be a great tribulation. And Jesus promises that we will experience the hatred of the world and the persecution of His enemies if we are His people. Today, we must acknowledge And we are not enduring anything like the Christians in Afghanistan or North Korea. But a reflection on the past 30 years or so of history and the dramatic changes and shifts in Western culture and society are alarming, whether you're in the U.S. or Canada. And we need to be prepared for such times as our brothers and sisters are experiencing around the world. And we need to be prepared for that great tribulation that Christ has promised in His Word. And I'd like to look at that from Daniel chapter 8. A breakdown of Daniel 8, we need to recognize, as I said as we read this chapter, we need to recognize that it begins really in Daniel 7, and it flows out of Daniel 7. And, and what we're looking at here is that that beast that was like a leopard, and on its back four wings of a bird. The beast had its four heads, and dominion was given to it. And that's all you find in Daniel chapter 7. But that very beast is expanded on in a great deal in chapter 8. In chapter 8, you have Daniel's vision in the first 14 verses. A vision that's concerning a ram and a goat that are fighting against each other, and this little horn that eventually comes out of this goat. And then you have Gabriel's interpretation of this dream in the second half of the chapter. And it's my prayer that Daniel 8 will serve, as well as Daniel throughout the rest of these chapters, which show us the necessity to be prepared for that great horn in Daniel 7 that is out of the Roman Empire that exceedingly wicked and terrible, strong beast. That is the Antichrist himself. But here we're learning about this little horn in Daniel 8. And in Daniel 8, this little horn is really a a picture of the great horn that will come, the Antichrist, that will come out of the Roman Empire or also the empires that flow out of the Roman Empire. Well, let's look at this with the theme, the little horn and the Antichrist. We're going to see this with the theme that the little horn, first of all, tramples upon God's people. And secondly, this little horn and the Antichrist is trampled upon by Christ. The little horn and the Antichrist trample upon God's people. We could even go farther back than Daniel chapter 7. And remember in Daniel chapter 2, that terrifying dream that Nebuchadnezzar had uh, was a picture of four kingdoms in this statue. Of the gold head was the Babylonian kingdom. The silver chest and arms was the, the kingdom of the Media and Persian empires. And the bronze, the 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 belly and the thighs were were the Grecian Empire, and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and partly clay was the Roman Empire and a whole sequence of history that flows from the Roman Empire. And Daniel 7 picks up on that in the the beast. You have the the lion, the Babylonian Empire, the bear, the media Persian Empire, the leopard, the Grecian Empire, and that terrible beast that comes 
out of which the horn would appear in a mouth speaking blasphemous words, that final Antichrist that would come from this beast. The Roman Empire and the empires that follow had a various amount of strength throughout this world. It had ten horns, and one horn arises that's terribly vicious and aggressive. Now, these horns that are pictured in, in these chapters are symbols of strength, symbols of influence and power and aggression against others. And so as we turn to Daniel chapter 8, even before Daniel has, has come to the time in his life that he served under the media Persian Empire, under Darius, yet in the time of the Babylonian Empire under King Belshazzar, as we read in Daniel chapter 8, verse 1, the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, under his reign he receives this vision, this vision of the ram and a goat. And this ram and this goat are really shown here in the first eight verses. In the first and, and verse 3, we find that he sees this ram with the two horns, two horns which are high, but one is higher than the other. And he's pushing westward and northward and southward, and no one can withstand him. And deliver, his power is great. And, and we know who this, this ram is, because in verse 20 we read that the ram which you saw having two horns, in the interpretation of Gabriel, are the two kings are the kings of Media and Persia. Media and Persia. These are, these are these two kingdoms. And then there's this goat in verse 6. And he comes up to the ram that has two horns. He's standing by the river and he, he runs at him with furious power. And he saw him confronting the ram and he's moved with rage against him. He attacks him. He breaks his two horns. And there's no power in the ram to withstand him. He's, he's so gracefully cleared the, uh, from, the, from the west. He's come with, without even touching the ground. He's like that leopard that has, that has wings. He, he's coming with furious power against, against the ram. And he conquers him. And this male goat, he, he grows very great. He becomes very strong. The large horn then is broken. And, and four more notable ones come... Uh, out in, and they're like toward the four hev- winds of heaven. Well, we also know who this male goat is. This male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between his eyes is the first horn, says Gabriel, in verse 21. And the broken horn and the four that stood in its place are four kingdoms that arise out of it, but they don't have the same power because they're divided. And this all comes perfectly true. Even though it's written some 300 years before the events by Daniel and this vision's given to Daniel, we know from history that Alexander the Great, the king of the Grecian Empire, is this male goat and he comes and he conquers the media Persian Empire. Alexander the Great dies and, and his kingdom is split in four and it's weakened because of division. But then there's a little horn that comes out of this. Now, not a lot is said about the historical account of the media Persian Empire and the empire under Alexander in this chapter. But the focus comes on this little horn because this little horn has greatly affected the people of God. And that is why Daniel is given this vision. It's with the people of God in God's perspective. And so the focus of history is on this little horn here in the revelation of God. And what does Daniel 8 tell us about this little horn? Well, in verse 9, we find that this little horn grew exceedingly toward the south and toward the east and toward the glorious land. The land of Canaan, the land, the promised land that God gave the Jews, the land where he established himself and his temple and his worship. And he's come against the glorious land. He's come against Jerusalem. And he grew up to the host of heaven. 
and cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trample them. Well, who are the host of heaven? Well, the host of heaven are the host of God's people. As we find in Exodus 12, that the host of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt. And here also, this, this is really showing that these hosts are the saints, the people of God. And, and this little horn has cast down these people of God and trampled upon them. The little horn, the Antichrist, they trample upon the people of God. And he seeks to rise up against the very prince of the people of God, the one who's leading the host. He shall even, we find here in verse 25, he shall even rise against the prince of princes. Now that's a title given to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's God who leads his people and he's given all authority unto his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, especially in the New Testament church. And so he rises against the God of heaven. That same God of heaven that is shown in Daniel chapter 2. The same God of heaven that protected Daniel. He's rising up against the God of heaven, the God of hosts, the Prince of hosts, and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's doing terrible things in Jerusalem, in the sanctuary, in the temple of God. The sanctuary is cast down. He's opposing the daily sacrifices. He's cast truth down to the ground. And he did this all, and he's prospering. How can this be? Oh Lord, how long before you deal with these evil people? According to what we sang in from Psalm 79. Well, who is this little horn? Well, we know from the interpretation of Gabriel in verse 23 through 25 that this little horn is in the latter time of this kingdom of Greece. When the transgressors have reached their fullness, we read, and the king shall arise having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Remember that leopard in Daniel chapter 7. He had been given dominion, given dominion by God himself. And God himself had given this little horn some power. And he shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. And he shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. He shall exalt himself in his heart and shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. This is a king who is bold, who is clever, who is powerful, who is destructive, who is successful, who is deceitful, and very treacherous. And we have the benefit of history. And all of the historical accounts of Josephus and the Maccabees to know that this person is Antiochus Epiphanes IV. The word, very word Epiphanes means a manifestation of God. Remember, he's not the Antichrist, as we find in Daniel chapter 7. That great horn. This is a little horn. A little horn that also manifests himself as God and against God and his people to show the people of God the terribleness of the great horn the ultimate Antichrist. And yet this Antiochus Epiphanes IV is a terribly deceitful king who specifically targeted the Holy Land and the Jews in his conquests. The history of this evil madman is graphically outlined in in the two intertestamental books of the Maccabees. And they describe the horrific period of this bloodshed that occurred from 171 to 165 B.C. Where he came into Jerusalem and banned the people of God from getting circumcised. Where he burned the very law of God. 
where he stopped the biblical sacrifices in the temple, where he set up an altar to Zeus in the temple and burned a pig, an unclean animal, on the very altar of God and killed 6,000 or more Jews. This evil king trampled upon the people of God, the worship of God, and the honor of God. And what does that matter to us? Well, let's first of all think about what it meant for Daniel. Daniel is now serving under King Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar had died after his conversion and all of the chaos within the Babylonian kingdom. Daniel's probably wondering what in the world is going to happen. And God comes to him in these visions and he actually is telling him things are going to get far worse for the people of God. And you must be prepared. Daniel, do not put your confidence in man, but in the king of kings. Don't put your confidence in kings of this world and kings of empires and kingdoms themselves, but put your confidence in the kingdom of God and His King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what's the message for Israel? Israel is receiving Daniel and his prophecy and his account of the time in Babylon, and they receive it during the very time of Antioch Epiphanes the fourth. And Israel is being prepared through this vision and, and encouraged to persevere in the faith. Since the reality of sin, the reality of evil, the reality of Satan and the Antichrist is absolutely certain. And God is giving them a prefigured Antichrist in the Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. And through it, they are being prepared by God to face this terrifying beast of Rome in the future. And Nero and Domitian, when Jerusalem will fall and there will be intense persecution on the early Christian church. It's a message for Israel. Israel, put your trust in me. Put your trust in the horn of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ who will ultimately defeat every horn. What's the message for us today? Well, throughout history, there have been antichrists. There have been many Roman empires, emperors. There have been popes. Muhammad. Hitler. Stalin, Kim Jong-un, the Taliban. There will be many antichrists, says the Bible. In 1 John 2, verse 18, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have appeared, says John. And from this we know it's the last hour. And therefore, as we heard this morning, beware, be vigilant, be sober, for the spirit of the Antichrist is all around us. Even as John says in 2 John 1 verse 7, for many deceivers have gone into this world. They do not acknowledge Jesus Christ. They are deceivers and the Antichrist. So we're called, secondly, to beware, be vigilant, be sober. To know the spirit of the Antichrist. To know those who are against Christ. Those who are against His work and His sacrifice. Those who are against His word, His law, and His gospel. Those who are against His worship. And those who seek to distract us and to deceive us from anything that is the true worship of God. Beware. Be vigilant. Be sober. And be ready. Be ready. Be prepared for the Antichrist. The one who will come after that terrible apostasy and the falling away that must come according to 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. And the man of sin is revealed that son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. 
so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In other words, be prepared for the Antichrist. And the only way you can be prepared for the Antichrist is to know the Christ before the Antichrist comes. Get to know Him in prayer. Get to know Him in His Word. Get to know Him in Bible study. Get to know Him in worship, family worship, corporate worship. Dear congregation, we are not on a luxurious cruise ship as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not who we are. We are in a battleship. And we need to be prepared, to be ready, to be equipped. Just think of that vision of the Titanic cruising along from Europe to America. All of their luxury. But they were not prepared for an iceberg. How many didn't perish? Oh, dear congregation, be prepared. But do not, do not despair. Do not despair. Because the little horn and the, and the Antichrist will be trampled upon by Christ. That's what we see in our second point. The little horn and the Antichrist are trampled upon by Christ. Notice, notice the contrast between chapter 7 and chapter 8. In chapter 7 you have these terrifying beasts. A lion, a bear, a leopard. And a furious, ferocious beast. And then you turn to chapter 8. It's kind of anticlimactic, isn't it? You have a lamb and a goat. You have domestic animals. Animals that are shepherded. Yeah, they have horns. And they have power. But they're domestic animals. What, What is this telling us? What is that telling the Jews? It's telling us this. As terrifying as those beasts were in Daniel chapter 7, the great shepherd, God himself, is in control of these beasts. And he pictures them in Daniel 8 as a ram and a goat. Domestic animals. And when those domestic animals get puffed up in themselves and their indignation and that cup of God's indignation is filled, God will deal justly with them and their aggression. They will be crushed, trampled on by Christ. Daniel saw in the end of this vision in Verse 13, didn't he? He says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How how long will this vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation? How long will the host, the people of God, and the worship of God be trampled underfoot? How long, O Lord? And he said, 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Yet just a little while. It will only be a short period of time. Five years. Or just over six years, sorry. And if we look at history, that's proven to be true. Antiochus Epiphanes IV ruled over Jerusalem and tormented it, persecuted the Jews, persecuted the host of God, the people of God, from 171 to 165 B.C. 2,300 days, just over six years that's described here. And some people say, well, it was actually only 1,650 days because it was talking about evenings and mornings and so on. But if, if that's the correct interpretation, the truth is that the intensity of the persecution and the desecration of the temple was only for half of that period of time. 
And it coincides perfectly with Antiochus' terror on the glorious land. And yet, it was an allotted time. It was just a little while, as we read in Psalm 37. Yet just a little while, and the wicked you will see no more. You will search for their place, and they will be gone. And isn't that what Gabriel's interpretation is telling us as well? The power of that one little verse, or not even, it's only a, a, a phrase, a part of a sentence in verse 25. But what encouragement it gives us. Hear these words. But he shall be broken without human means. In other words, the trampler will be trampled upon by the God in heaven, by Christ himself. And it's exactly what happened to Antiochus Epiphanes. His obsession for material, his obsession for more glory, and for more worship was met with disappointment and failure, and it ate away at him like he had stomach cancer. Josephus wrote that through his failures and anxieties, he, was, he fell into like a distemper. It's like he had rabies or something. And, and it was so severe that he called upon some of his friends and said, and confessed this that the calamity that was sent upon him was for the miseries that he had brought upon the Jewish nation while he plundered their temple and contempted their God. And when he had said this, he gave up the ghost. He died. The book of Maccabees, in 2 Maccabees 9, is a, kind of an almost a rated R illustration of this by saying, the all-seeing Lord the God of Israel struck him with an incurable and an invincible blow. As soon as he stopped speaking, he was seized with pain in his bowels from which there was no relief and with sharp internal tortures. And that very justly, for he tortured the bowels of others and many, and with many strange inflictions. And when he died, he was brought down to earth and carried in a litter, making the power of God manifest to all. And so the ungodly man's body swarmed with worms. And while he was still living in anguish and pain, his flesh rotted away. And because of the stench, the whole army felt revulsion at his decay. Well, from history we know that Antiochus Epiphanes died a horrific death. And it was not at the hands of man. It was at the hands of God himself. What a message for Daniel. Verse 26, he's told the vision is true. And therefore seal up the vision because it refers to many days in the future. It reminds Daniel, and it highlights the very weakness of the strongest and greatest of men without God. Alexander the Great himself died of fever. Antiochus Epiphanes died a horrible death as he was overwhelmed in his passion against God. Daniel, I'm going to show you the end of these wicked kings and their abominations so that I can encourage you to live faithfully today. How did Daniel live? We know how he lived from Daniel 1 through 6. He lived under the sovereign hand of the God of heaven. He lived out of the victory that there is in God and in Christ. He was controlled by God. He knew he was nothing apart from God. And he lived out of God. In Daniel 8, verse 27, we read this. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Daniel was overwhelmed. Just like we ought, ought to be overwhelmed by this vision today. 
when we see what's happening in the world. He was overwhelmed. He fainted and was sick. But then he arose and went about the king's business. How must you and I live just as Daniel lived? Just as Charles Wesley lived when he was asked, Charles, what would you do tomorrow if you knew Jesus Christ was coming? Charles opened up his day planner said, I would do this in service to God, I would do this in service to God, and I would do this in service of God. That's what Daniel did. That's what you and I are called to do in such times as this. Consider the impact that this message had on Israel. In the time of Zechariah, when the same angel, Gabriel, comes to him and tells him that he's going to have a son in their old age, and he doesn't believe, and he's struck with dumbness. He can't even speak. And the first words that come out of his mouth after he's allowed to speak again is, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, who has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of of his servant David. He has raised up a horn to crush that little horn. He has raised up a horn to crush that great horn. He is the great one, the horn that will trample all other horns. What's the message for you and I today? That horn of salvation came to us. He lived among us. And he told us what's going to happen in the last times. I want to read part of that from Matthew 24. I know no time is gone, but I think it's important to hear. Matthew 24. And if you just lay, I'm not going to make all the applications, you just lay this passage with the news that you have heard and seen with your own eyes in this past week, let alone even in the past years. I'm not a prophet to tell you that Christ is coming on such and such a date. But I am going to tell you as a mouthpiece of God that He is coming, and He's coming soon. Matthew 24, verse 3. As He sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him and says, Tell us when these things will be and the signs of your coming at the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, Verse 4, Matthew 24, verse 4. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and I will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, The love of many will grow cold, and he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's Daniel chapter 8, standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days.
pray that your flight may not be in the winter or the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not taken place since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall ever, ever shall be. And unless those days are shortened, no flesh could be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. I don't read this to depress you. Well, quite the opposite. There are three reasons why we need to take Daniel 8 to heart. There are three reasons why we need to consider the truth that Jesus has spoken in Matthew 24. And the first reason is this. It needs to call us to flee to the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who has ultimate victory. That great shepherd who controls the rams and the goats. The one who will come like lightning. The one who will come riding on that white horse in Revelation. Who will come and who will trample upon the enemies of Christ. And the blood will reach the bridles of the horses of the hosts of God who come in His victory. I don't know if there's anything more important for you and for me today than to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to know that the battle is His and we are in His battle. We are in His army as the hosts of heaven. Secondly, we are called to live a holy life in this world. Your congregation, do not be deceived. Christians do not ride through life to heaven on a luxurious cruise ship. We are called to live for Christ to live out of Christ, to live for Christ. And we need to know that position, thirdly. We need to know that our position is in Christ, the Prince of hosts, the Prince of princes, the one who has put us in his battleship to fight, to blow our horn of victory in the face of the horns of this world to blow our horn knowing that we are in the horn of salvation who tramples upon the Antichrist, who tramples upon Satan and all who are in him. And when we are in Christ and we know that the victory is ours without even any human hand, God has turned the most wicked, the greatest, the most powerful emperors and kings on themselves and their own being. Our hope is not in man. Our hope is in God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we consider <clears throat> the truths of your word in light of what's happening all around us in this world. To whom else will we go but to you? Draw us unto yourself. Grant us all the weapons we need in this world, in our Christian life. Grant us, Lord, that we would seek to serve you every day of our life and that we would be prepared every day of our life because who of us could ever think that we could stand in the face of persecution in ourselves? Lord, strengthen us for those battles. For we know 
that in those times of tribulation, the persecution will be so intense that even will seek to devour the very elect of God. So be pleased, O Lord, to grant us a short period of tribulation and preserve us and our children in and through the Lord Jesus Christ and bring us to the shores of the heavenly Canaan where all torment, where all torture and all persecution will be put to end once and for all. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.